So going home, because uh, I am Bulgarian by uh, nationality, and although I have not lived in Bulgaria, worked in Bulgaria for many years, that was literally for me going home. But there was another reason for it, and that had to do with the objectives of the project. So the project I will be talking about mostly is called ResNexus. It was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK, and it was part of a larger international cooperation. There were other projects in Brazil and in Kampala that looked to investigate the interdependencies between food, water, energy, and the environment of what is widely known as the urban nexus. The interesting thing about this particular project is that uh, data collection uh, took place in Sofia in two large chunks of time. So uh, the first one took place in June and September 2017 and the second one in January and March 2018. And the reason why this is actually quite interesting is because it was intentional. Um, the nature of the study required me to um, spend some time in the summer and early autumn uh, where some of the main practices that I studied were carried out. And then I had to go back into the winter months in order to um, study zemlina consumption and heating and increased energy use uh, in the home. And that's quite important because I saw different things coming back to the same places um, in two different seasons. So my fieldwork was very unusual as well, at least for me. Uh, I carried out loads of observations. When I say observations, I basically um, watched people prepare Zimnina, do urban gardening, and quite often I had to get involved. Um, uh, my humble estimate is that during this fieldwork, I peeled over 80 kilograms of tomatoes while talking to people and questioning them about how they prepare Zimnina. Um, I peeled about 15 kilograms of peppers, chopped about two kilograms of onions and spent a total of 52 hours making Zimnina. I mean, that actually seems um, like a really long period of time to do these activities, especially considering that they were part of um, doing research. But um, I just had to say that it has been one of the most uh, pleasant experiences of doing research anywhere in the world. So apart from the observations and um, activities I carried out during them, I also did 54 interviews, two focus groups and 12 questionnaires. So when we study the nexus, we essentially look at hidden connections. So when we investigate the interdependencies between food, water, energy and the environment, uh, we're essentially looking at things which are, at least most of the time, not clearly connected. And when you start planning about how do you look for something which is mostly hidden, I have to say that this is where that idea to go back home came from, because I thought that um, if I was familiar with the environment at a, at a different level, um, then I would be able to see things more clearly. And although that physically meant that I actually went home, um, I was uh, carrying out the, the research in Sofia, which is not my uh, hometown, and uh, I was essentially uh, an outsider outside as much as I would be uh, anywhere else in the world. But there was an element of this where I was at home while carrying out this research um, because of the nature of the activities that were carried out and how naturally they came to me. And this might seem like a strange beginning for a presentation that wants to talk about transitions. But as I progress with the presentation, hopefully you see where I'm coming from. So for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the urban nexus, I just wanted to highlight certain things. So essentially, there are different interpretations and definitions of what's included in the nexus. But if we're looking for common denominators, then we're looking at interactions, interdependencies between two or more elements, quite often we talk about systems. That allows us to focus on how things are connected. So we 
that means that we examine not only the synergies, but also the conflicts and the trade-offs between these different elements, how they arise and how they're being managed. So specifically in this project, we adopted uh, an understanding of the nexus, uh, which was around interacting social and physical systems. So that means that uh, we took a um, quite multi-centric approach. We were interested in nexus thinking and nexus practices. And uh, in different stages of the study and in, in, in even in different sites, uh, we encounter different variations of the nexus. So sometimes we were talking about energy, water, food nexus, food, energy, water nexus, water, energy, food nexus, and so on, essentially studying the same thing. So if, you, if in my presentation I refer to more than one of these, uh, please don't be alarmed. One of the reasons why we felt that we couldn't talk about urban systems and how they are linked to each other and what the synergies, conflicts and trade-offs that emerge. Mm. Because um, we needed to really talk about the increasing import uh, importance of climate change in the environment. And this is something that uh, a lot of nexus literature and thinking is uh, picking up on. But I also want to warn you that this is a different type of project from the urban nexus projects and the urban thinking, which are based around uh, finding more efficient ways in which to bring together different urban systems. Um, that usually happens with uh, the introduction of new digital technologies or um, new data. Um, instead, what we were interested in were the non-technical and nature-based solutions. We were interested in the ways in which, particularly those that live in the periphery, people who are marginalized and considered to be vulnerable, how did they actually experience in practice uh, these uh, different elements of the urban nexus? To study this, uh, we've decided to focus on three systems of provisioning and study free essentially user practices, uh, that was urban gardening, making zimnina and domestic heating. So I would say that when I started the project, what I imagined to be urban gardening uh, turned out to be very different from the urban gardening that I encountered. Um, so the urban gardening, when we speak about it as a practice, we're referring to essentially uh, an informal practice which involves all activities related to the growing of food, um, and they're not limited to the boundaries of the city. Um, we found that a lot of urban gardening was carried out in a way which had strong connections with other spaces, uh, which are beyond the city walls, so to speak, and some of them could be uh, quite far away from the city itself. So we studied a wide variety of urban gardening uh, spaces. So from allotments and community gardens to uh, peri-urban off-ground cultivations. And that kind of urban gardening was happening in loads of uh, different places from people's windowsills to terraces, to sunroofs, to um, little green spaces in between uh, blocks of buildings. The, what was interesting for us was the functional relationship that the different activities involved and spaces involved in urban gardenings had to each other. So um, that means the way in which any elements of the practice of urban gardening depends on a flow of resources and materials from the city. So when I talk about making Zimnina, I bet a lot of you don't even know what I'm referring to. I'm hoping that uh, the Bulgarian listeners uh, today know exactly what I mean. So making Zimnina is uh, referring to a broad category of informal practices, uh, usually carried out by households to preserve food for the winter. Um, this is um, most usually involves canning fruits and vegetables. And just so to help you, um, this is the remaining Zimnina that I have uh, for <coughs> this winter period. It's not a lot and it's more like gold dust. I don't know whether you can see it, but I'm holding up a jar of uh, tomato sauce um, to my camera. Can anyone see it? 
Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Thank you. I see it. Okay, great. Excellent. So uh, this for me is more important than gold dust. Um, so making zemina is something that traditionally happens in Bulgaria. It's been going on for decades and uh, it's something that I spent my childhood doing. So the fruit practice was um, basically domestic heating and uh, how people were hoping were coping with increased uh, energy use. So um, I want to do this. Um, I want to talk to you about encountering the urban nexus in Sofia for the study in pictures. So when I started looking at urban gardening, uh, these are the kind of spaces that I visited. So this is in uh, a parking spot uh, between um, different multi-story buildings in Sofia. Um, I believe that this is the house that or living quarters that belong to the person that's guarding the the parking lot. And uh, I can tell you that uh, they had an amazing. Uh, kind of garden growing loads of uh, very tasty tomatoes. This particular place, it's uh, quite close to one of the first and most well-developed urban gardens in Sofia. Uh, it's called Druzhba, Green Kaze Druzhba, and it's a, a collaborative project um, involving different individuals. Uh, some of them live in the blocks that you can see in the distance. The majority of them come from all over Sofia. Some of them would travel uh, more than an hour every day to come and tend to their gardens. Right, when I talk about making Zimnina, I have to say that I expected initially that Zimnina would be made within, uh, within the specific uh, places where people lived. Uh, I expected that that will be um, houses, um, that will be in their yards. Um, it will be happening mostly in kitchens. But what happened in fact uh, is that the practice of Zimnina making was something that was extremely spatially disaggregated. Um, it took, um, involved a lot of transformation so um, here you can see peppers um, that are being grilled at the entrance of a building, which is only 10 minutes away from uh, the Bulgarian parliament in Sofia. So it's in a very central location. Um, and uh, the lady is preparing Zemina early in the morning and she was doing it in the corridor of her building because it was the coolest uh, place um, in the summer. And obviously there was a lot of heat involved in uh, grilling the peppers. But I also found that people were uh, carrying out different elements of the transformation of the fruits and vegetables that they were preparing for the winter um, in different places. So quite often I encountered people who would use public spaces. Uh, you can see that another way to grow the peppers was uh, to do so in our makeshift um, oven, uh, which was bang in the middle of a road, um, not that far from uh, Sofia city centre as well. So <clears throat> what I didn't expect is uh, when I talk to people about observing how they make something like the tomato juice that um, I'm showing you now, um, it's called Litanita, that that would actually involve uh, me following different activities, which in some cases uh, took place um, over more than one week. So to clarify, um, to make something like this jar of lutenica, you'd have to peel a lot of tomatoes, uh, you will have to grill and peel and chop a lot of peppers. Um, in some cases, um, you, there are additional herbs that go in. The interesting thing is that there is uh, a lot of preparation which is involved and a lot of people uh, living in an urban environment, densely urban environment like Sofia, do not have access to all the tools and the spaces that they need to carry out these activities. And that's one of the reasons why we found that urban gardening and making Zimnina were things that were happening with strong connections to uh, other places. 
in a lot of cases, I um, saw people that would do part of the preparations in the city, on their terraces, rooftops, outside <laughs> buildings, on the street. And um, <coughs> they would freeze um, and they would transport uh, what they have prepared to another place, which could be an ancestral home. Uh, I think the most extreme case scenario was uh, someone drove to Ruse, which is on the other side of the country. Um, and it's um, a journey that takes several hours in order to um, complete the final stage of Zemlina making. And then people drove back home with uh, the jars of uh, Zemlina where they stored them. Similarly with urban gardening, um, I found that a lot of people had gardens in their ancestral homes outside of the city and they would regularly travel um, to them. They would regularly carry out uh, different equipment um, with them and in some cases in the intense months of uh, urban gardening gardening people would um, actually travel there on also on a daily basis so it wasn't the neatly bounded um, practices that i expected in case you're wondering what happens to the zemnina once it's made uh, this is a quite a fair representation of what happens to it. What you're looking here is the amount of zemnina on average that uh, is needed for two people to uh, basically um, rely on heavily um, during a winter period. So you can see there is a lot of jars. Um, some of these are desserts. Uh, they include fruits and compotes. Um, but the majority of them are different types of vegetables and meals which have been pre-prepared. Of course, in an urban environment, uh, it also transpired that it's a luxury to have a space like this in order to um, store the zemnina. And quite often I found that um, these stashes of zemnina would be literally embedded in other living spaces. I've seen shelves of Zimnina in people's bathrooms, people's toilets, uh, under beds, on top of kitchen cupboards, um, and in quite a few cases for people living in flats. I see these um, little storage areas in communal areas where they um, stack um, jars and jars of Zimnina. Um, this particular jar of Zemlina has a huge significance for me personally as a researcher and for the project. Um, this is a jar of Zemlina which comes with its own history and has led me to um, seek new ways in, with which to engage with policymakers. But what you're seeing here is essentially um, what a vulnerable pensioner in Sofia would eat um, in one day during the winter. And the significance of this is it. So when I talk about the urban nexus, um, this is exactly what the urban nexus looks like. So it's not a neat little diagram that shows uh, how different systems interact with each other. But this is a jar that tells the story of how urban gardening uh, and making Zimnina in Sofia are used by vulnerable people um, every year in order to um, allocate resources that they have their disposal and to cope with your poverty. And in their own words, I call it the fuel poverty nexus, a jar a day. Um, this jar belongs to Anna, uh, who was uh, 86 in 2018 when I spoke to her. And in her own words, she prepares the jars of Zemina, like this one. Um, in such a way that when she opens it up in the morning, she's able to um, have at least three meals out of it. So she puts everything, so she puts the seasoning, the salt, the vinegar. Um, and this is done so that it would not need to add anything else at a later stage. And that it's done in a way that it will be perfect for her to open in the morning and eat throughout the day and finish um, for dinner. Um, 
So the way she does this is usually she puts it on, um, so she takes out a few peppers that you can see with a bit of seasoning uh, and she puts it on uh, a piece of bread and this is what she eats for breakfast. Um, then for lunch, uh, she would usually use a lot more of the sauce and she would just dip the bread in. Um, she will have more bread with uh, lunch and uh, with the dinner. And uh, the beauty of this jar is that it has helped her survive. Jars like this have helped her survive and cope with the energy bills um, for decades. Uh, sometimes she uh, has it cold. Sometimes she puts it on top of the log burner that's in her house, in the one room in which she lives in, uh, usually during the winter. Um, this jar is really useful for her because it's really easy to store. Um, if it's properly done, it can keep for six months. Um, and it's an important way in which she actually controls uh, how much energy she uses um, during the, the winter months. So I'm going to expand on this a bit later on, but the kind of the key message uh, I want to highlight here is that how this jar is actually prepared in order to serve the purpose of uh, keeping um, good and tasty for six months and giving her an opportunity to eat for a day. Um, that has come with uh, special obligations and requirements uh, of how the process of making Zimnina is carried out. So in order to ensure that uh, a jar can keep for this long and uh, it's ready to eat, um, you have to use open fire in order to boil to high enough temperature. Uh, everything needs to be washed really well. Um, it's not something that um, can, I mean, it can be done on a hob, but it will require a lot of electricity. So the preference of a lot of people is to uh, start open fires in order to complete that part of the process. And in this particular quote, you can see the direct link between um, how the jars are prepared and the purpose that they serve is to um, help manage heating bills. Um, what is not included in uh, this particular quote, but it would be quite useful to know, is that um, Anna um, spends more than um, five to six months a year um, in a little shack outside of Sofia, where she has a plot of land, um, where she grows all the vegetables and all the fruits. She does also a lot of gathering uh, in the nearby area. And this is what she uses in order to prepare her jars of Zemnina. Um, Anna is not an exception. Anna is uh, unfortunately a one of many people that I found in Sofia um, who were living in those ways. Um, so Maria is another example. So she was also a pensioner. Um, she lives quite close um, to the Sophia city centre and quite close to the um, picture of the lady using a gas grill uh, to grow peppers was taken from. Uh, she has been making Zimnina all her life. It's the way she was raised. It's the way that uh, she looked after her family when she was younger. And it's what she resorted to once, uh, you know, she became a pensioner. So she, for her, starting to preserve food for the winter um, starts as early as June. Um, but um, as the case with Anna, um, actually, she starts preparing um, her urban garden um, in March. So it's a very long process. Um, so she peels, boils, fries, stuffs and closes jars with fruit and vegetables almost every day um, from June until the end of September uh, to make uh, enough food to last her until uh, April next year. And I already showed you a photograph of how much food is required. So Maria talked a lot about her experiences on what was the right way 
of uh, preparing the semina, putting a specific emphasis on the importance of cleaning all the vegetables, fruits and glass jars and metal tops really well. So it's very uh, water intensive process. Um, frying everything long enough and boiling the stuffed jars at a high enough temperature so that lasts for six months. Um, so usually you see that uh, there's different types of energy sources which are used from gas to wood and in some cases to coal um, and electricity in order to prepare these zimniness. Um, she makes one litre jars of mixed vegetable seasonings, cloves of garlic, which can be eaten cold as well, uh, salad uh, warmed up on the wood burner in the room. Um, so she makes smaller jars of about 200 to 300 millimetres um, of compote. So these are pieces of sweetened fruit uh, in water, which could be a dessert or breakfast in a day. And uh, as with Anna, her practice is driven by the need to provide a full meal or even multiple meals for the day for herself. This allows us to spend a minimum amount of money on buying things which she considers to be necessities, during the winter, so that would include, in her own words, medicine, bread and soap. Everything else um, that she has in terms of pension, she spends on bills uh, with heating and electricity being the biggest one. An example is when I spoke to Maria, um, her pension was uh, 360 leva and uh, her energy bill was uh, more than um, half of that uh, on a good month. So uh, for Maria, making zemina is an important way to redistribute food through the winter, and it's impossible um, without growing her own fruits and vegetables to do so. So the reason why I wanted to talk about Maria and Anna's experiences is because they provide a very good illustration of the food and energy interdependencies that we see in the urban nexus. And these are kind of interdependencies that were not easily visible unless uh, <coughs> I found unless you speak to vulnerable people and unless you watch the different practices that uh, they're involved in repeatedly. Some things are not even clear from themselves and uh, they transpire through the process of observation and uh, helping them by chopping up things and grilling and so on. So the energy use or particularly the non-use of energy dictates decisions about urban gardening and making zemina and that covers the point of seeding to the point of consumption. So choices about what is going to be planted and when are uh, mostly driven by uh, how much semina is needed, um, what grows well and what uh, some of these individuals, uh, they live on their own, so what they would be able to actually prepare and store. Also, at what point do they decide to pick the fruits and vegetables uh, so that they are suitable for preservation and consumption? That's uh, a very important aspect of it as well. So, um, as you've seen from uh, statements from Anna and Maria, the way Zimnina is prepared is closely linked um, to how energy is used or not used at the point of consumption and the fact that it's uh, really a jar a day that makes them uh, keep up on top of their electricity bills. So what I've seen is that vulnerable people prepare Zimnina in a way which does not need to be cooked, uh, heated or refrigerated. And these are the ways in which they basically control how much energy they use during the winter period. So what energy and how much energy will be available and use for the making of Zemina and its consumption can shape practices of urban gardening. So what to grow, when to plant and how Zemina is prepared, stored and consumed. So also the way Zemina is made uh, is shaped and shapes energy access and use and it can affect how urban gardening is uh, practiced. The important thing here well, about this particular element of the urban nexus is that it's the practices of urban gardening and making zimina when considered together, when synchronized, when uh, they're kind of complementary, that allows people 
um, the means for resource redistribution between the seasons. And those resource redistribution includes energy. And this is an important finding when we're talking about uh, energy transitions. The one thing I wanted to highlight um, in this presentation is that sometimes you can only see things if you're in the right place at the right time. And for me, the urban nexus and the relationship to our food, water, energy and the environment came together in a very powerful way uh, once I started my uh, second bit of fieldwork in Sofia uh, between January and March 2018. And the reason for that is that when I landed in Sofia um, very early in January that year, I was literally greeted by uh, the winter fog. So this is a beautiful uh, photograph of one of the kind of more prominent um, bits of the surrounding environment that you can see uh, in Sofia. But also apart from the beauty focus on the kind of the fog that you can see that would lay over the city, uh, this fog is particularly difficult to breathe in. And uh, it was in, in the winter of 2018, it was there for several weeks. It dictated how people, you know, when people will go out, uh, how often people open their windows. Um, and this happened during a very cold spell uh, in Sofia. If I remember correctly, it was uh, minus 15 degrees Celsius. So the reason why I started with this is because um, we have to, in order to talk about the urban nexus in Sofia, we have to introduce two things. I mean, fuel poverty, I think it became abundantly clear that it was something that was at the heart of the nexus. But I want to spend some time talking about the connection between fuel poverty and air pollution. So they are tightly linked. Um, Bulgaria has long been a the country with the highest rates of fuel poverty in the EU. Uh, there are different estimates. Uh, the most recent one says that it's something between 42 to 60 percent of Bulgarian population uh, experience fuel poverty, and that could be particularly seasonal. So people might be experiencing fuel poverty for several months uh, of the year. Unlike situations that we see in uh, other places um, that we carried out urban nexus studies, such as Brazil and Kampala. In Uganda, we saw that uh, a lot of the people who will be classified as fuel poor were actually working individuals and they had what you consider to be good jobs. Um, fuel poverty rates uh, were particularly high in densely urbanized areas, such as Sofia. Um, at the same time, Sofia is one of the several most polluted European cities in southeastern Europe. Um, the particular air pollution that is pertinent to uh, this project and to the urban nexus is um, particulate matter. And that's mostly due to the use of firewood and coal um, for residential heating. Um, and it's not just the, the resource that's being used, but it's a combination of uh, you know, infrastructure and practices. So um, a lot of the residential heating of burning of wood and coal happens in old and inefficient stoves. And um, I would like to highlight that the reason why this is happening also is due to other elements of infrastructure that we should consider. So um, the majority of the vulnerable people I studied uh, during this project lived in uh, what are considered to be badly insulated uh, buildings. Um, so there are very low levels of uh, energy efficiency. Uh, in some places, people had uh, taped the window sills with cellar tape, put uh, towels around them in order to um, keep the you know the rooms that they were heating airtight. Um, also, this is specifically linked to district heating and how district heating is provided in uh, many areas of Sofia and the quality of the service which is provided by district heating. So I'm mentioning these things because um, <clears throat> quite often we think about fuel poverty, 
is something that happens at the point of consumption and something that happens to specific people who um, are vulnerable because of their personal circumstances. So vulnerability such as uh, long-term unemployed, disability, or uh, being a pensioner, unfortunately, we discovered that being a pensioner is a specific type of vulnerability in this context. Instead, what we found is that these vulnerabilities emerged as much from personal circumstances as they emerge from um, the infrastructure transitions uh, that were happening and have been happening for some time in Bulgaria. So, for example, the district heating that was put in place in Sofia uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, meant that the installation of uh, already at that point uh, quite old type of uh, infrastructure, um, then there were inefficient ways in which um, use of hot water and heat are being measured uh, and people pay for. Um, it also leads to uh, problems with uh, the way in which uh, district heating company in Sofia um, is actually um, arranging bills and uh, loads of other reasons which are, are systemic issues rather than personal circumstances. So what that has led to is uh, a significant increase in the mass concentration of uh, particle matters, particularly uh, 2.5 particles. Uh, they have been up by 30% over the past 10 years, and uh, there's been a five-fold increase in the concentration of wood smoke traces. So the air quality in Bulgaria has been steadily decreasing, um, and quite regularly the Places like Sofia record um, concentrations of particle matter 2.5 and 10, uh, which are much higher than the limits set by uh, the EU and the World Health Organization. And um, quite sadly, just like fuel poverty leads to premature deaths, um, I would say, unfortunately, air quality and decreasing air quality also leads to a lot of premature deaths um, in the country. So the, the connection actually, once you see it, is, is quite simple. Vulnerable households suffer from uh, high fuel prices, poor infrastructure, poorly performing housing stock, heating systems, and the use of low quality fuel. Um, so quite often that means wood, coal, briquettes. Um, on several occasions of uh, people I studied, I also encountered people who would burn things um, such as old clothes, uh, plastics, and things that they generally find uh, outside on the street. Um, so people who are vulnerable, vulnerable households, also have a tendency to have limited information about options um, of how to heat themselves in uh, a safe way and uh, they have limited information about the health impact of the heating options uh, that uh, unfortunately um, they are limited to. So uh, an interesting thing about um, how energy is, um, is provided and used in Bulgaria and uh, in Sofia is that many households rely on multiple energy resources, um, and that could uh, often include gas, electricity, district heating, and wood. Um, of going from, you know, watching people uh, in urban gardens do their gardening, then uh, going into their homes and watching them um, prepare their zimnina and then visiting them again. And in a few occasions, I had to watch people uh, basically eat their zimnina, uh, heat it up. Um, I've seen that wood burning stoves coexist with electric radiators. Uh, there's central heating and air conditioning. Sometimes uh, these multiple uh, sources of heat uh, are in the same room. And uh, in some cases, we see that each room in a house is kitted with an independent and different way of providing the necessary energy services. And the reasons for this are multifold. So the winter in Bulgaria, um, as I mentioned, um, could be quite harsh. Um, temperatures could drop to minus 15 degrees. Um, also, 
the way in which uh, district heating and uh, other forms of heat, such as electricity, uh, a range are suffering from a series of uh, systemic issues around billing and access to uh, meters. Um, in addition to that, um, Sophia also has um, quite poor building stock, uh, which is in the process of being retrofitted. But a lot of people are stuck in properties uh, that are not possible to be retrofitted for reasons which are not linked to whether they want to have them retrofitted or not. Um, if you live in an apartment building, for example, uh, there are certain things you can uh, do to retrofit your own property. But if you want uh, to have uh, an external retrofitting, uh, you would have to have the agreement of um, everyone in um, the whole apartment building. Uh, quite often the uh, funding which is available for retrofitting work also works in such a way that even if there is one household in the building uh, not interested in carrying out the work, uh, people cannot access uh, the grants and financing available for it. Um, at the same time, um, people have, through their experiences, through the energy, multiple energy transitions that have uh, taken place in uh, Bulgaria um, for the past, let's say, from the early 80s onwards, um, people have uh, doubt about the real how reliable different sources uh, of energy are. And these reasons lead to this uh, less than seamless kind of environment of energy provision and energy services within um, houses and apartments in Sofia. So <clears throat> as a result, Sofia experiences substantial emissions of short-lived climate pollutants, uh, black carbon, uh, which is a particularly big contributor to global warming, is one of the most uh, commonly encountered um, pollutants and the reduction of particulate matter and nitric oxide pollution during the winter season is actually directly proportional to the reduction of solid fuels such as wood and coal uh, for domestic heating. Uh, it's a quite a straightforward link between fuel poverty and air pollution nexus. However, it's one uh, which is uh, very hard to impress on policymakers and urban planners. So the trade-offs that I talked about, which are inherent to understanding uh, of how the urban nexus works and adopting an, an urban nexus thinking. So these trade-offs and choices uh, faced by those in vulnerability uh, to meet their heating needs uh, are driven as much by the things that are traditionally associated with fuel poverty as they're driven by their coping practices. So this is where we start thinking about how do we bring these different elements of the urban nexus that I've been talking about. So means to practice urban gardening in making Zimnina um, is a way to manage access and affordability of heating in a way which allows vulnerable people to practice healthier energy use in the home. Uh, that could, in simple terms, mean um, they will have more resources to keep the district heating radiators on rather than um, adopt you know, start thinking about how they are going to uh, burn um, wood, um, briquettes, uh, coal, or anything else in, in, in their apartments. So ability to synchronize the free practices of urban gardening, making Zimnina and energy use and heating through the different parts of the year in order to manage the food, water and energy resources really shapes the way environmental resources such as clean air and gas emissions in the atmosphere manage at an individual and household level. And I would say that uh, Sofia being a densely urbanized area um, kind of provides uh, additional restrictions on um, the ways in which uh, urban gardening takes place, making Zimnina takes place, and also, uh, I think it also ameliorates and amplifies the negative effects of uh, using these less environmentally friendly uh, means of heating themselves. So, <coughs> apologies. 
Um, as before, and as is best put in the words of uh, people encountered during the study, uh, one of them was Christo, uh, who was 57. He was a taxi driver. And he explained that uh, the way he manages uh, this nexus on a personal and household level is uh, through a what he describes a complicated system that has taken him years to work out. And he was saying that uh, just kind of, changes to the system that could mean that he can no longer do it will be um, very hard to replace and it's going to put them in a very precarious situation. So <clears throat> he's also preparing early. Um, he starts collecting wood uh, in May in the year. Um, he does a little bit here and there during the week. Uh, if he sees uh, some uh, pieces of wood branches that cut off lying around, he takes it and puts it in the car um, and he collects at least a bag of branches every weekend in one of the nearby parks. Um, so he goes there for um, evening walks with his wife and uh, they pick up what they can see from the ground. It's the same with Zemnina <clears throat> and the parallels here between the collection of wood and things to burn and the collection of food in order to prepare Zemnina are quite striking. So he also operates the jar uh, here and there every day policy. Um, so he buys some of the stuff. Um, he talked about specifically cheap plums that he found in the market. Uh, he talks about things that uh, he sees in the market that are about to be thrown out because they're a bit um, perhaps hard to sell or slightly damaged. And uh, he also grows um, some stuff such as green beans uh, on his terrace on window sills and just outside of his uh, apartment building. So this is how, you know, Crystal was good at the art of bringing little things together and making something that lasts. So he describes it as just a few handfuls um, of stuff. They add a clove of garlic, some herbs, um, and that is really helpful on days when they don't have a lot in the cupboards in the winter. Um, they put a few potatoes on top of the wood burner to boil. Uh, it takes a bit longer to cook them this way, but uh, then he's able to uh, add the tomatoes and green beans that he has prepared to mix it all up and uh, throw other things such as pickled cabbage, uh, another staple of uh, Zimnina in Bulgaria. And and that's uh, him and his wife sorted for the day. Uh, he says it's uh, really tasty and uh, very easy to, to do. Christo lives in a very tall apartment building. Um, his next door neighbor, <clears throat> however, doesn't is not able to get involved in making zimina in in similar terms or to do urban gardening. And uh, he is actually uh, using, um, he has made a, a makeshift burner um, in his kitchen where he sleeps during the, the winter with his wife. Um, they actually uh, use this one room uh, most of the time when they're at home. Um, and um, Christo's neighbor actually often burns plastics or clothes and things that he finds outside. Uh, this is particularly uh, difficult for Christo because Christo has an asthma and uh, whenever his uh, neighbor burns um, plastics or old clothes or anything else, uh, there is a, uh, I mean, there is smoke that comes out and Christo is not able to open windows. But rather than being resentful, uh, Christo explained to me that his neighbor is struggling more uh, than he was. Um, because they're not being able to plan ahead uh, and they not have the same access to space uh, in order to grow things. Um, particularly, he says that his neighbour is a hard-working couple, but uh, the man has mobility problem, can bend down and turn the soil, and uh, his wife works um, all hours as a cleaner. So they are unable to make Zimnina from things that they grow. So they make Zimnina from things in the market and that is expensive. Um, so the way in which Christo's neighbor makes Zimnina and uses it, it's more of a um, 
not something that will help them survive on a day-to-day basis, but it's something uh, as a treat, something which is considered to be much tastier and nicer than anything you can buy in the shop. So the reason why uh, we talked about this extended uh, urban nexus um, thinking is because it provides a great opportunity to reframe some of the ways in which uh, national level policymakers, urban planners, and even researchers like ourselves uh, who do research on transitions think about some of the problems that uh, are being encountered by people. So <clears throat> interconnected practices of urban gardening and making Zemina can help stop practices of reverting to more uh, air polluting heat provision in Sofia, such as burning uh, low grade fuels, wood, plastics or clothes, etc. I think this thinking about the whole urban nexus also presents um, vulnerable consumers and people in a very different light. I would say presents them as experts in resource distribution rather than people who are struggling to manage the resources uh, at their disposal. And I think that's a considerable change in the way uh, policy and urban planning thinking can be put in place. And it's one that particularly uh, policymakers and urban planners in Sofia really struggle with. So um, just to give one example, If we're thinking about a nexus intervention in Sofia to address uh, issues around air pollution and fuel poverty, could involve providing support for urban gardening and making Zemlina. And that's very different from uh, the way in which uh, fuel poverty is supported right now. Um, People who are considered to meet certain criteria for vulnerability are given lumps up of money to cover the cost of energy, which goes straight back to the energy company. Um, fuel poverty support this, this way, if we are thinking about a nexus intervention that supports urban gardening and making Zimlina, that would mean that uh, the support itself would not be limited to the winter months, but it will be something that could happen for most of the year, as I've discussed, urban gardening can take place from March until November, and gardens in Sofia can produce vegetables such as broccoli and spinach even during the winter months. So um, it means that in order for this kind of uh, urban nexus thinking internet, uh, interventions to be introduced, uh, there has to be a uh, acceptance, a political acceptance and understanding of uh, how these issues are interconnected. However, the connections across uh, the food, water, energy and the environment or the urban nexus in Sofia are poorly understood and politically neglected. And the reasons for that is um, a sum of the, the kind of misfortunate framings that I encountered when talking to policymakers and urban planners. So, <clears throat> for example, I was told that these are not really urban practices. The making Zimlina is something uh, that, you know, happens in villages uh, because it's something that uh, requires open fires and, um, you know, the idea of policymakers was that people would actually uh, go to ancestral homes in villages outside of the, the capital and this is where they would make Zimlina. But what we found is that Zimlina and the multiple transformations, uh, which are involved, the blending, the freezing, the boiling, the grilling, uh, they're spread over time and multiple sites of transformations. And some of them might be hundreds of kilometers away from Sofia. Um, And this particular travel of going backward and forward could be the cause of a lot of associated emissions. But it doesn't make them any less part of these urban practices. We were also told that Zimnina making doesn't really matter because it's not widespread uh, and it was used for um, self-consumption only. And this was seen as a reason why the government uh, or policymakers shouldn't actually get involved. I was told that if Zimnina was being sold, that would be a different story. But in fact, what I found out is that uh, Zimnina and particularly jars of Zimnina, like this one, um, travel quite far 
and are regularly passed on um, and exchanged with family, friends and um, neighbours and people that are considered to be in need. I encountered a lot of arrangements where um, different households would come together. Some would buy um, some of the stuff um, for making Zimnina, others will provide produce, some will provide the space. Um, and they will come together. And a lot of uh, cases, people also pay people, other people, in order to prepare Zemina and to bring it to their home. Um, one of the most powerful narratives uh, that led to this uh, blindness of policy to the urban nexus and its implications had to do with the fact that um, a lot of a lot of um, kind of policy people believe that urban gardening and Zimnina are just hobbies. Um, and this is a powerful quote from someone I interviewed that thought that um, urban gardening is practiced by a handful of people who have lived outside of the country and after their return to Bulgaria, seeking to replicate a Western way of living. The interesting thing about this quote is while we're having this discussion, I look down and this person I was uh, interviewing, I looked down at their hands and their hands were basically had multiple little cuts and uh, they were colored like the hands of someone who would peel uh, several kilograms of peppers and tomatoes in order to prepare something like rutanitsa. So although they were clearly engaged in this practice themselves, um, they didn't seem for it to be essential or something which was widely spread. Because um, this belief that this was not, these were non-essential practices, they were optional, um, they were not primary candidates for public resources. And particularly, um, there were a lot of people who were trying to start up um, gardens, urban gardens in Sofia. And uh, they were trying to get access to uh, suitable green land and also uh, in some cases to ways in which they can use water resources on these green properties and it was particularly hard for them um, at this point because not only because urban gardening didn't have an official definition but because it wasn't seen as something that um, could actually help people who are vulnerable it was seen as something which is optional and i'm hoping that if i manage to convey anything today is that for people like crystal Maria and Anna, it's far from optional, it's, it's a way of living. Uh, another narrative which was very unhelpful was that urban gardening and making Zimnina small scale, uh, their informal practices and their things from the past. The past. So uh, there was the narrative that Zimnina does not happen in cities anymore uh, and it was just happening in some villages and peri-urban areas. And therefore it was uh, an issue um, that should be addressed there rather than in cities like um, Sofia. So there were no institutional uh, understanding of interdependencies. Um, there were no policy or action which aimed to address the nexus challenges. Um, and when policymakers talked about uh, nexus challenges, uh, they were limited to categories such as waste to energy or water as food uh, type of uh, practices. So, I in the in the final minutes of this presentation, um, I wanted to talk about uh, how this particular experience uh, changed how I did research and changed the way in which I sought to um, create impact with. talked about just now, it was really level that uh, there was a lot of merit in uh, adopting uh, a nexus thinking in order to understand how these different systems of provisions and practices are related and how they can support each other and provide alternative ways of addressing issues such as fuel poverty and um, uh, air pollution. Um, instead, uh, the kind of the policymakers I spoke to um, would talk about things um, such as uh, 
these particular graphs that you can see here. Uh, they can show um, household average spend. Uh, this is the top one and the bottom one is about uh, levels of vulnerability in, um, in Bulgaria. So they will talk about figures and they will talk to me about uh, evidence. And the evidence that they wanted was um, primarily linked to quantitative data. Um, they asked me why was why was I not doing surveys to show them the numbers of uh, people that were actually engaging in these practices. And they were sure that I've been spoken to a few rare examples of uh, urban gardeners and uh, other type of uh, Zimnina makers and users. However, this is at the point at which I decided that there was a uh, merit in me completely changing the way I looked at evidence. Um, at the end of uh, my fieldwork in Bulgaria, I was given as a present from many of the participants with whom I peeled tomatoes and peppers, a 16 jars of Zimnina. And I used nine of them uh, <laughs> to take them to nine different meetings with policymakers uh, where we talked about fuel poverty, energy transition, and uh, evidence for solid policy making and urban gardening. And whenever I came to the wall, it was like a wall of policymakers thinking that this was not sufficient evidence. I will roll out my jar, like this one here, and I'll talk to them about how this jar contained the urban nexus and how they spoke about the different practices around fuel poverty, the way in which food, water, energy are linked and the way in which air pollution is inherently linked to these practices, the ways in which they are related. And I found that that appealed on a very different level. We're not talking about the rational a kind of clarity that comes with facts and figures. So we're talking about a different types of emotional connection that people, particularly in Bulgaria, had with these jars of Zemnina. I think a lot of the people I spoke to have had Zemnina and they understood what was involved in it. They could see they could clearly see it. I don't think it led to any changes uh, in specific policies yet, but I think a lot, I mean, of all nine people I brought jars to, um, I think they all agreed that this was one of the most compelling evidence uh, which was ever introduced. So by doing that, I started a whole new line of research, um, for which <coughs> I have uh, carried out uh, two independent projects where I looked at um, how we can create complementary ways of providing evidence for policymakers, um, where we not only use statistical information and modeling, uh, which is quite abstract, but we use uh, objects of the transition that helps us understand some of the hidden relationships between heterogeneous systems and elements uh, in a way which is emotional and appeals to us as human beings. Um, I think I've advanced quite a bit with time, so I'm going to leave it here and uh, switch off my PowerPoint slides. And I look forward to a discussion on um, the linkages uh, that exist with uh, transitions thinking and the cohort of new researchers that you represent. Thank you very much for listening at this point. Thank you very much, Ralitza. Uh, first, for this uh, illustrative way to point out all the elements of a system. Uh, we are uh, speaking about system, talking about system thinking in system. Um, and we are all actually part of a system. Um, and it, I, I think it's, it's extremely important for all of us before starting thinking of solutions to um, be able to define the problems uh, correctly, which is actually the uh, case with the energy poverty in Bulgaria. Um, and you show us uh, in with your presentation, energy poverty in Bulgaria is firstly, before everything else, a poverty. So lack of all kinds of resources. Um, and
in the jars that you show us, they are artifacts, materialization of uh, this cultural heritage. Uh, Zimnina is not only a way of saving energy, but it's also a healthy, healthy way of nutrition. Um, and um, it, it brings a lot of knowledge from our uh, grandparents uh, and previous uh, generation. We, we got a, lot, a, bu a bunch of questions for you. Um, so um, I will start with uh, some of them for the for with the first one. Um, Jan Stark um, is asking um, Rally so observing such interconnected nexus. What are the implications for transitions researcher? Um, to what extent it's even helpful or feasible to? Um, the market singular transitions like the clean energy transition or would this pool change processes out of the uh, nexus context yeah thank you for this uh, question um actually a few minutes before uh the keynote started i was uh, part of the energizer <laughs> and one of the questions was um during the energizer session was like, which do you think is the most important uh, transition? Is it the energy transition or other types of transitions? And um, although I am uh, essentially a uh, energy transition uh, by heritage, uh, this is what I was trained in. I have to say that the compellingness of the urban nexus uh, research is show how you cannot change one system without leading to changes to other systems. And um, for me, it will be counterproductive to focus on improving one specific system, such as the energy system, in order to address issues like fuel poverty or um, climate change, air pollution. Um, I think a useful way to move in a in a more just and inclusive way will be to consider not only what kind of uh, policies can be put in place from the bottom uh, to seek to lead to more efficiency at a system level, but to consider actually the ways in which the lived experiences of people who are disadvantaged by current systems how they can be used to introduce uh, more resilience and alternative approaches to addressing these. Um, so in Spru, where I'm based, we have a lot of energy transition scholars. And um, some of my colleagues, um, such as Jochen Scott and uh, Ed Steinmiller, talk about deep transitions. So these are deep underlying transitions, which are made up of a series of small, smaller transitions. And uh, quite often I think about that uh, nexus thinking and particularly focusing on the ways in which different types of transitions um, are interlinked in a way that leads to emerging properties that could sometimes become hidden in um, dominant ways of thinking about transitions, such as the MLP, um, such as this. I think this kind of thinking could be quite useful and um, I think it's up to you to figure out ways in which you can introduce it to existing dominant literature. Um, I see likely benefits from doing it. Um, so I will watch this space and hope uh, some of you pick up this work. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Um, Mahto uh, is asking um, whether you are, you perceive this type of urban urban gardening uh, and cooking as sustainable practice. What is your opinion on this? Oh, that's a very interesting very question. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I have to say that the 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 elements of the project that are presented here was just one part of it. And uh, a lot of the urban gardeners and similar makers that I studied were actually attracted into um, were doing it because of the, the health benefits, because uh, of being 
you know, because of other systemic issues around food safety and public health um, and then being able to uh, control what goes into their food and wanting to to kind of consume certain um, quality of food. So we, we actually looked at the ways in which those kind of sustainable ways of uh, thinking about the urban nexus, um, how they sat against those uh, vulnerability understanding of the urban nexus. And I have to say that uh, that was extremely difficult to do. What, what I find quite difficult when we talk about sustainability is um, the extent to which what we define as sustainable, what our understanding of sustainability is and what sustainable practices are and how badly they fit within the realities of some of the people I spoke about. Um, I think for it's all relative. Um, I would say that um, the practices, for example, that uh, Christo talks about in comparison with his neighbours, I would not have described them as sustainable, but relative to his neighbour, I would say it's more sustainable because uh, it leads to uh, a lot less air pollution. And in terms of, I would like to think of them as kind of telling us important aspects of resilience I think this is the one bit that I'm quite uh, interested in as a result of this finding and that is uh, how you can achieve a certain level of individual and household based resilience in a system and a society which is constantly changing So can we can we actually conclude that sustainability could be defined in a different way for vulnerable uh, people? I I think we need to have a broad understanding of what sustainability is, and uh, the one of the key issues with sustainability literature is that it, for a long period of time it tend to be focused on specific type of systems such as energy systems transport systems and specific contexts which require eurocentric and it's in the recent years that we have seen a real expansion on different contexts and how what is being studied in these contexts such as china uh, for example uh, the developing world um, that it's really challenging some of the assumptions of how uh, different types of transitions are taking place and what are the implications of these transitions for these specific contexts. So I think it's quite important to continue to expand and to consider how what we learn about these different contexts uh, changes um, our concept conceptualization of what is sustainable transitions. I, on a personal level, I believe that uh, the more we think about and do things about sustainability, uh, the more kind of moral commitment we have to sustainability. And it's quite likely that um, if we engage in this kind of sustainable thinking of long periods of time, uh, the, the kind of the end goal, the post will move quite a bit with our understanding. And I sincerely hope that uh, this is what we're going to see. On a personal level, I hope one thing became clear that um, I was quite emotionally engaged and committed to this project, um, not only because it was one of the first cases where I actually directly worked with vulnerable people, and not only because it was at home, but, um, Mostly because uh, I think uh, passion and emotions are quite important in doing research, particularly on transitions, because it pushes you to do things and see things differently. And that's something that I would strongly encourage everyone to retain. The more passionate you're about something, the more likely you are that you're going to uncover different elements of it. So... I would say for myself uh, and a lot of other transition scholars, uh, this is not just a research area. It's something that we're deeply committed to on a, on a personal level. 
Um, there is a question from Marie. Um, she is asking um, if you experience the development of networks uh, to cooperatively do urban gardening and make Zimnina in Sofia, for uh, example, for sharing space and tools. And I would like to add another question to this one about the um, a connection uh, between these practices and the young people. This was a question from Marte. Um, how important is that the knowledge on these practices is transferred to the newer generation? That's a good question. Thank you very much. Um, I would say that I don't want you to um, be left with the impression that there is a, a, only a negative story to tell here. Uh, as a matter of fact, something that I didn't focus on is that um, watching how this one of the urban gardens that I studied and I mentioned, Drushba, how it actually developed over time and the relationships between uh, old people and younger people in it um, were some of the most rewarding aspects of uh, fieldwork that I've ever experienced. Um, I would say that uh, since I concluded the research early in 2018, a lot has uh, changed in Sofia and uh, the urban gardening movement has emerged as a very strong movement, uh, which is quite inclusive. So the urban garden in Druzhba that uh, I was fortunate enough to observe for a long period of time had uh, quite a lot of pensioners that were able to uh, kind of not teach, but they share their knowledge about how you, what's the easiest way to, to do things um, in the garden because it's quite labor intensive. Um, and there was uh, a, a lot of cooperation, um, sharing of tools. It was truly a communal garden. And one of the best things that uh, I've seen also emerge uh, from um, this garden is a collaboration with a solidarity kitchen would not bombs in Sofia. They do wonderful work. Um, and they started uh, doing urban gardening with volunteers so that they're able to provide food um, for, they take care of something up to, I think, 100 vulnerable people in Sofia uh, by providing them uh, vegan, vegetarian meals uh, a few times uh, a week, sometimes every day. And I have to say that ability to grow their own food and to preserve this food for the winter has been a game changer and has provided uh, a more stable source of um, food and resources um, for a lot of vulnerable people. So <laughs> I would say that um, rather than seeing uh, this being a, you know, most of my examples were pensioners, but um, that doesn't represent the type of people who are involved. There's a lot of young people involved in the growth of urban gardens. There's a set of questions related to policy. Um, so David asked, but this was at the beginning of your presentation, the first part, um, if the local re regional government is carrying out any strategy to promote an urban transition in Sofia, maybe you could also um, elaborate more uh, on this. And then we have also a question from Leo. Leo Frank, um, he is asking, does it still make sense to think about experimentation when potential failures, which are a necessary part of experiments, have potentially dramatic effects on vulnerable people uh, related to policy experimentation in transition studies? Um, I will start with uh, Leo's question first, and that is... Um the fuel poverty in, in Bulgaria is uh, quite normalized, and this is the really scary thought, that it's not considered to be something, uh, you know, quite shocking, or it's not considered to be a crisis, at least at a national level, and something that has to be addressed in a more systemic way. Um, and I think um, things like the Solidarity Garden, um, the Solidarity Kitchen, uh, they are experiments, <laughs> they're bottom-up, grassroots level, in, innovative experiments, which have, and, and this is in relation to the first question, have successfully found avenues 
of linking up to uh, more progressive urban planners in Sofia. They haven't gone as far as uh, national level policy, but they have managed to at least uh, argue quite successfully for providing a definition of urban gardening uh, for uh, planning in Sofia. And this is uh, a game changer because if there is a definition, then you can start building policies around it. Um, I would say that uh, the one misfortunate element uh, of um, decision makers at national and urban policy level is not only the failure to recognize the multiple ways in which uh, these different elements of the urban nexus are linked to each other and how they manifest, but um, it would also kind of challenges the assumption that um, you cannot work with uh, informal groups such as Solidarity Kitchen or a kind of an urban garden, which is an assemblage of different people, can change between seasons. Um, you cannot, as a policy and decision maker, there is an, an understanding that you can work with these people in order to create new experiments and new pilots. And the kind of experiments that I would suggest that they'll be quite useful to be carried out are not to do with um, kind of removing one form of support, for example, the winter fuel payments, but it will be about trying to provide different type of support um, to people who are experiencing uh, fuel poverty. And um, that will be specific. For example, um, it could be uh, free travel in recognition that urban gardening and making Zimnina are practices in Sofia which take place in multiple spaces. Um, free travel uh, is going to be a game changer for a lot of people. Um, there was one person um, I was uh, observing in the urban, urban garden in Drushba. I mentioned him. He used to he used to travel for more than an hour and a half in each direction from one part of Sofia, in order to get to the garden. And there were in the summer he had to do this almost on a daily basis. Um, there are also opportunities to uh, give people access to free gardening tools and perhaps to uh, give people access to free water so they, they can do more urban gardening. So there is, I think, uh, a plethora of different ways in which experimentation can take place to find out what will be the best way in which to support people in a way that allows them to continue to practice something that's tried and tested and really works for them. Sam Bursan, I hope I, I have pronounced uh, the name uh, correctly. I uh, would like to know uh, whether you have considered using models as white boxes instead of abstract black boxing models that show only numbers and graphs. Building models together with policymakers can be one way of showing the uh, different inter interdependencies in the food, water and energy nexus. Um, I mean, uh, there are many multiple ways in which uh, you can attempt to co-create uh, understanding and solutions with policymakers. Um, I don't have sufficient knowledge by why boxes modeling. Um, unfortunately, in my life, I have mainly uh, worked with uh, different types of models. But um, I would say that anything that that kind of gives you an opportunity to engage with uh, policymakers and decision makers, uh, not only on a professional but personal level, um, would be quite useful in this sense. And, and particularly in the context of uh, Sofia, there was a lot of denial around urban gardening, making Zimnina, and I encountered a lot of denial about fuel poverty. I mean, at one point, uh, people I was talking to in the urban gardens were denying that they were in fuel poverty uh, on a personal level. And then I would go into their homes and I would look at the ways in which they arranged their lives and think that I would definitely find this as fuel poor because it fits most of the definitions that we used to. But they wouldn't assess themselves or define themselves in those terms. And that was not just linked to pride 
it was linked to the fact that they were, have found a way in which they manage and consider themselves to be quite lucky in the way in which they're able to manage this. Um, so I believe that any process um, that can bring those people together with uh, decision makers and policy makers and help co-create solutions and help foster understanding um, would work really well. And uh, I, I admit that uh, rolling up to uh, a lot of national level policymakers with jars of Lutonitsa and talking to them about fuel poverty and air pollution has not been a very pleasant experience, at least in <laughs> at the start of the conversations. And it's a, it's a pretty brave move, maybe slightly silly and stupid as well. Um, so you just have to see it to the end because otherwise you just become this person that turned up to this meeting with jars of Lutonitsa and wanted to talk about, um, you know, systemic change and uh, doing, you know, policy differently. So I'm sure you find multiple ways in which this could work. We are at the end of the session. That's why I'm asking uh, the West, question uh, from Ines and I uh, would like to um, ask you for a short answer. Um, how do you think, what do you think would be the implication of your study uh, or how do you think would, uh, would you apply the findings um, outside of the SOFIA context in other uh, places, are other urban uh, smaller cities or um, villages? Um, outside uh, Sofia? Um, I think because of the, the nature of the practices of urban gardening and zemlina making, um, first of all, um, Bulgaria is uh, by far not the only country in Europe uh, that, you know, for which these practices are deeply embedded. Uh, we have uh, seen similar things in Greece, in uh, Poland, uh, in a lot of uh, in Serbia and Croatia, and in a lot of countries, the Balkans and Central and Eastern European uh, countries. And um, I would say that the kind of the findings that we have in Sofia um, could be quite easily replicated uh, in any of these contexts because there is a lot of similarities around the systemic issues that have in a way produced these kind of coping uh, strategies. Um, also, I'll have to say that um, although Sofia and the densely populated area uh, presented specific challenges, uh, we have already seen um, similar initiatives starting in other places in the country, um, such as Varna and Plovdiv. Uh, they notably now have networks that organize around urban gardening and uh, solidarity movements. So um, this is already an indication that um, the urban nexus and these coping practices exist beyond the Sofia case, both in a subnational context and outside of Bulgaria. Thank you very much. It was very interesting for me, also emotional. <laughs> um, and um, as I said, we are at the end of the session and I would like uh, to ask you to uh, check uh, on the program um, which uh, rooms you have to enter after the break. Um, and another comment. Um, it's about the organization of uh, next year's conference. Uh, yesterday we had a small get together, um, but I'm sure that not everyone could um, participate uh, there. So I will put in the chat um, a form which you could uh, fill in if you're interested in um, another um, session, another conversation, another online meeting where we can um, discuss the options for organizing um, next year conference. Ralita, thank you very much for being with us today and um, to present us um, this uh, um, detailed uh, insight. Um, and um, we hope that you will be around 
for uh, further questions. If not, um, I guess uh, our participants could um, connect uh, with you and um, discuss it further. That would be great. Thank you very much for the invitation. And for those of you who are not able to make it to Sophia in person, we strongly encourage you to do so once it's safe and uh, to find someone that can share with you some Rutenita. <laughs> I, I also promised Ralitza to send her Lutinita to, to UK, <laughs> but probably I would be able to do it. Okay, thank you everyone and uh, see you around.